just say a little more about myself. Yes, when I was six years old, I was taken away from my foster parents and given shock treatment. I spent um, the next 10 years in a state mental hospital. I got out when I was 17, and I worked my way through college. Got into graduate school, had various jobs like medical lab technician. And then in 1971, I heard about the group called the Mental Patients Liberation Project, and that was in New York City. I've been active in the movement ever since. I've been president of Mind Freedom International. As uh, Martin said, we succeeded in getting a shock treatment band, at least in Berkeley. That was quite a long time ago. But I'm not here to talk about myself. I think I want to talk to you about psychiatric power. And I think there's two aspects. First of all, you've heard from Terry and Bob that basically psychiatry doesn't have a whole lot to offer, but there's a great belief in it. Now, I'm, I'm a little tentative about saying this, being American and commenting on Irish culture here, but I know that in this country, people are, have stopped believing in one religious group. Now, in the United States, I can tell you that although polls will tell you Americans all say they're religious, they're not. Most people's religion is buying things in the United States. We've exported that part of our culture pretty well, unfortunately. But I think one of the biggest cults in the United States is psychiatry. And you know, it's very tempting to allow somebody else to do your thinking for you. You know, if, you, if you're struggling, this whole business of depression being diagnosed used to be one in 10,000, now it's one in three or some nonsense like that, is because people would rather, it's easier rather than struggling with what's making you unhappy, and there's always some reason to be unhappy. I mean, life is bumpy, you know. It's much easier to let somebody else define it for you and tell you how to live, to tell you that all you have to do is take some drugs and numb yourself out. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to give up your own thoughts. And again, I'm really hesitant to say this, being American and all, but I think Ireland is struggling against that now, and I would hope, because what I also sense here is that although psychiatry is a lot of power, it doesn't have the kind of power in Ireland that it has in the United States. I think in the United States, it's really turned into a full-fledged religion. You know, what is a religion? You, you, believe, you believe that these group of people have all the answers, right? They have all the answers in spite of the fact, as Bob and Terry have demonstrated, that they don't have answers, that they don't have cures, that they don't have much in the way of help. Now, I'm not saying there's no such thing as a good psychiatrist. I've had some. Uh, Bob briefly mentioned Lauren Mosier, who, yes, Lauren, Lauren uh, did some research showing that if people didn't get drugged, they're much more likely to get better. Bob didn't mention that Lauren was practically driven out of the profession after that. He had a very high-ranking job in the federal mental health system, and he was basically driven out of that system because he was a heretic, you know? Drugs don't work. And of course, that's what's happening with Bob in the United States. The psychiatrists are in a frenzy here. So what is Bob really telling you? Is he a heretic? Is he some kind of leader of a different cult that's a in competition with a cult of psychiatry? No, he's just saying these are the facts, like a, like a science journalist is supposed to do. So why, now psychiatrists, you can understand why they would go into a frenzy, because it's really a great attack on their power. Because if you don't believe in psychiatry, if they really have to presume, produce results, they're not going to do too well, because not too many of them produce results. So. What I want to ask you to do, and I don't know what, how this audience breaks down here, I suspect there's an awful lot of people who have been recipients of psychiatric quote-unquote help. I think, well, I could ask people to raise their hands, but I know from past experience that if I ask people to raise their hands if they've uh, been in the psychiatric system, not more than one out of 10 people will really be ready to admit it. But I'm going to guess here, I'm going to guess that half this audience are people who've been in the system, and the other half of the audience are people who are sympathetic or open-minded or want to hear more or whatever. And I want to say to both groups, to those who are already trapped in that system, don't look at what's happening to you. Has it helped you? 
I don't think you think so. You wouldn't have come to this meeting. You wouldn't have come to something organized by a group called Mind Freedom. You wouldn't have come to hear people like Terry and Bob. You know you haven't been helped. You know you're trapped by these drugs. And I would say, try to liberate yourself from the attitude that the psychiatrist must, must know best, because they don't know anything to speak of. And those of you who are not trapped in the system, again, I say, don't turn this into the kind of religious cult we have. That's what it is in the United States. It's a cult. A cult. It's exactly what it is. In the United States, and I guess all over the world, but especially in the United States, the psychiatrists try to, to pin the opposition to them on a group called the Church of Scientology. I measure their role. Do you have much in the way of the Church of Scientology in our A bit, probably, right? They're very active in the United States. And, and I certainly don't agree with them, and they're a very authoritarian cult, because that's what they are. But I'll tell you, the Scientologists never gave me shock treatment. The Scientologists don't go around getting people hooked on drugs that shorten their lives for the rest of their lives. So it's sort of one cult against another there. So that's one way you give people power. You believe in them, you, you turn them into another religion. Uh, I, I'm saying, don't get trapped in substituting one religion for another. And I'm going to apologize for the 15th time here, because I think it's very presumptuous of me to comment on Irish culture, but you all know what I mean. Don't, don't believe in this garbage. Don't give them that power. If you're already trapped by them, take a look at what they've done to you and decide you're the best, you're the best judge of what's good for you, not somebody who's demonstrably shown they don't have very hardly anything to offer. Now, being an attorney is another kind of power I want to talk about. And I hope there's some attorneys out there in this audience that are sympathetic to this cause. Because although I'm not an Irish lawyer, obviously, and I don't know Irish law, you have provision. I have looked at the Irish Constitution, and I have looked at the Mental Health Act of 2001. And I can tell you that any kind of lawyer could see, if you look at the provisions in the Irish Constitution about you know, individual rights, like all people are equal before the law, and things like that, uh, which are very similar to the provisions in the US Constitution, the Mental Health Act is totally unconstitutional. And I would hope, I would hope that lawyers here take up this issue. Because what does the Mental Health Act say? And one of the things that almost amused me was, along with setting up this system, says this is all to protect the rights of the people you know, who might get put into mental institutions. Well, what, how does it protect them? Here's what it says. I think most of you may know it, but many of you may not. And those of you who are not in the system, I want you to contemplate something else. But first, I'll say this. The law says that basically you can be committed for 21 days if one or two psychiatrists say that you have a mental disorder. That's very important, mental disorder. Well, first of all, that's not a legal standard. If I were an Irish lawyer, I couldn't get anybody out because I can't say that somebody has a mental disorder or not. That's left to the psychiatrist. So basically, in this democratic country of yours, and I'm very impressed, I'm very glad I was here for your parliamentary election, which I think you're a lot more democratic than the United States. It's a wider range of opinion. I think that because your members of parliament are elected by a smaller constituency, they're going to be more accessible to you. I'm very impressed with the democracy of this country. Now, I'm telling you, a law that allows a certain group of people to be locked up with no legal recourse. I mean, I know there's some sort of panel or whatever, but it means nothing. It means nothing from the point of view of a lawyer because I can't argue, that's not legal. I can't say that you or you or you are not suffering from mental disorder. But now, let me go back to people that haven't been locked up. Mental disorder, that's the word that's used in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual number four, and they're coming out with a number five that I think, in a way, is even better. Right now, I would say about 75% of the population, when you take DSM, has hundreds of mental disorders, right? Uh, I'm not sure it's in DSM-4. I know it's coming to DSM-5. Do you spend a lot of time on the computer? I do, but of course I've already been diagnosed. So. But then again, how many hours a day do you spend on the computer out there? Those of you who aren't locked up yet. 
you haven't been locked up yet, you're suffering from a mental disorder. I'm not sure how many hours you're allowed to spend, but that's a mental disorder. It fascinates me. They don't even use the word psychosis. They're basically saying, if you fit one of the descriptions in the DSM, and a psychiatrist wants to do it, they can lock you up. Now I know you're going to say, oh, they won't do that. No, no, no. Well, they won't. That only happens to those really crazy people. You think so, eh? But what's stopping them? If you give a group absolute power, you know, there's a saying that I always thought, uh, these old sayings, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, it does. And you're really in danger. People, you know, for instance, I've seen people who never imagined they were going to be locked up. They get into some kind of argument somewhere. Suddenly they're in a mental ward. And if they're really unlucky, they get hit with a really heavy drugs. And the next thing you know, they're in there forever. My, my ex-wife, my first wife, who was also leader in this movement, <clears throat> she got into an argument with her psychiatrist. And she found herself on the way to Rockland State Hospital, where I spent almost my entire childhood. So those of you who aren't already in the system, don't think you're exempt. 